Mr. Gandhi, welcome to Stanford. Would you like the podium? Do you like to address from the podium? Yeah. Please. Go straight there? No, you please. Okay. Once you make your comments, we can have a conversation. Do you want to say something? We just, just please, talk. go ahead. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to come and speak to you. Um, I've heard a lot about your institution. I spent some time in one of your competitors. Um, it's an honor for me to be here. I've been asked to speak about global transition and how the world is changing. And also, how one should act through that change. How one should think about acting through the turbulence that is obviously going to come. I heard in the introduction that I was a member of parliament until <laughs> a few months ago. Um, I don't think when I joined politics in 2004, I ever imagined um, what I see going on in our country. It was, it was way outside anything that I had ever imagined. To, to be the first person to get a full criminal sentence on defamation, to get the maximum sentence, and to be disqualified from parliament. Uh, I didn't imagine that something like this was possible. But then, I think it's actually given me a huge opportunity, probably much bigger than the opportunity I would have sitting in parliament. That's just the way politics works. I think the drama started really about six months ago. Uh, we were struggling. The entire opposition is struggling in India. Uh, huge financial dominance, institutional capture. Uh, we were struggling fight the democratic fight in our country. And we decided none of the, none of the systems were working. Uh, democracy isn't just about an opposition party. It's about a set of institutions that support the opposition party. And those institutions uh, were either captured, certainly weren't playing the role that they're supposed to play. And so we decided to do something quite strange. We just decided to walk across the country. And we never imagined for a second what would happen when we walked across the country. What would happen not just politically, not in terms of the type of response we got, but what would happen to us when we walked across uh, our country. All of us. There was started with about 125 people, and it fundamentally transformed the way we think about our country, about our people, about politics, about what is important. A lot of people ask me, you know, what's the lesson you've learned from this? And 
for a long time, I couldn't quite say what it was. I couldn't answer. I'd, I'd say, you know, I, I've, I've picked up so much information overload, I can't really tell you what this has done. It was the most beautiful experience of my life, by far. Uh, it was very painful. I had a, I had a knee problem. It, you know, it's, it's one of those things you get up and you say, okay, we're going to walk 4,000 kilometers. So, some level, it's a crazy thing to even conceptualize. And I thought that would be, I'm reasonably fit, I thought it would be, shouldn't be too difficult. I calculated it in my mind, I said, well, what's it going to be? It's going to be 25 kilometers a day, no big deal. And then I had a knee problem. And then the whole thing, the way life works, everything just transformed itself. We met what I would best describe as the soul of our country. And very quickly, in a week, 10 days, a silence descended on us. We couldn't speak. We went from trying to explain things to people. You know, this is why agriculture isn't working. This is how you should think about education. Uh, this is how, you know, the healthcare system should look. This is what, you know, we should be doing. And suddenly we just went silent. We all went silent. And we went silent because we came into contact with a intelligence that we had never seen. That we had never even conceptualized could exist. Farmers who, you would say, many people would say, don't have an education. And then who are explaining things to us in a way that we just are in stunned silence. Right? And we saw this with farmers, with laborers, with small businessmen, everybody. And so this silence descended on us. And we just sort of stopped talking and started listening. And we heard tales of immense suffering. I mean, I, I, I can think immediately, I thought, about one where, which sort of, to me, embodied the spirit of my country, our country. I was walking, and a young man came and started walking with me. And I put my arm on his shoulder, and suddenly I realized he didn't have arms. So he had no arms. And I, was, I tried to sort of make him a bit comfortable, didn't want him to feel that I know you don't have arms. He wasn't too bothered. And we started talking, and I asked him, listen, what do you do? And he looked at me, and he said, I'm a mechanic. The immediate thing in my mind was, he's lying. How, how can he be a mechanic? He doesn't have arms. It's impossible. So I said, well, I didn't want to be direct. I didn't want to say, you're lying. I said, listen, what cars do you repair? He says, I don't repair cars. I repair motorcycles. So I said, oh, yeah, what motorcycle do you repair? And he started listing all the motorcycles. So I said, can I come and see what you do? And he said, yeah. And then he proceeded to take us and show us how he serviced a motorcycle with his feet. It's the most amazing thing I've ever seen in my life. He took apart the entire engine with his feet. And he put the entire engine back together with his feet. I can't do it with my hands. So we saw these type of things happening. And we saw clearly the disconnect between our politics and our people. And that, that disconnect is visible in the United States, it's visible in the rest of the world. There's a huge divide between the people and the politics. Politics is talking about something else, people are talking about something else. We experienced this multiple times. And as I was walking through this, I kept thinking, 
something puzzled me. What I couldn't understand is that while we were walking, we had no force. Force was completely on the other side. The other side had police, they had the institutions, they had the media, they had social media, they had everything. And here was this group of people, in a few weeks it became thousands and then millions, just walking, and all the force at the disposal of the government of India could do nothing. And the more they tried to apply force, the less it worked. And so this puzzled me. I was like, how come they have all the force, they have all the systems, and nothing's happening? Why, for example, are they just not physically stopping us? And this was a question that just kept rotating in my mind. I'm like, why is it that they have the force, but they don't have power? And I realized that force and power are two completely different things. Most people, politicians in particular, confuse force and power, and they think they're the same thing. They're not the same thing. They're completely different things. Power is an act of imagination. Power is in the present. It is not linear. And power comes when you go close to the truth. The reason we could not be stopped by force is because we were weaving around near the truth. And what was really interesting to me was it didn't matter how much force the other side had. They simply could not transfer that force into power. And they kept saying to us, you know, people would ask us, so when are you going to stop? We're like, we're not going to stop. We're going all the way to Kashmir. No, you're not going to be able to go to Kashmir. They told me in, in Kashmir that, look, if you, if you walk the last four days, you're going to get killed. They're going to throw hand grenades on you. I was like, fine. No problem, let them do it. Right? I want to see, I want to see the person who throws a hand grenade on me. And the, 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 the security guys, I mean, the, the people from the establishment there, I could see in their face that they just couldn't understand what I was saying. Right? So, this distinction in your life, in your work, is very important. It doesn't matter how much force the other person has. You can still have power. And it is determined by how close you are and how precise you are with regards to the truth. Now, you can see these moments. Mine was a very small one. Uh, you can see these moments of power versus truth in history. Big ones. Example, my leader, Mahatma Gandhi, fought the entire British Empire. He had no force. They had all the force all the structures, the army, everything, didn't matter, right? The Declaration of Independence here in the United States, again, a moment of power, a moment of truth, doesn't matter how much force the other person has. So why am I telling you this? Why am I making this distinction between power and force, and what does it have to do with the transition that we're facing? 
Well, the transition we are facing, there are three transitions. There is a revolution in mobility. There is a re uh, revolution in the energy system. And there's a revolution in connectivity, what we call AI and data. These are the three revolutions that are taking place. And they're going to affect everything. The last time we had a similar transition, a, in a transition of energy, a transition of mobility, we had two world wars. Right? And it's in times like that of great uncertainty, of turbulence, that you need acts of imagination. Now, while I was coming here to Stanford University, I was thinking about it. All the work that you do, a lot of the work that you do, robotics, AI, where was the moment of power? The moment of power was when President Kennedy said, let's go to the moon. Right? That was not an act of force. That was an act of imagination. And from that, a lot of the work you do, you do has emerged, evolved. And that's the type of relationship the United States and India should be thinking about. A relationship that's based on the true reality of our people. We know in India a lot about the reality of our people. All of you know. You live in our great country. You know the levels of poverty that we have. You also know the amazing amount of skills that we have. The United States has the world's cutting edge technology. And we already have a bridge between us. It's important that this bridge is not simply a bridge based on force. But it's a bridge based on the reality of our people, on an understanding of the realities of both our people. India has some huge advantages. In a data-centric world, we have one of the largest pools of data. You over here are a testament, many of you, to our skill in technology, in software. There are many more young people like you back home who don't have the opportunity you've had, who could augment our capability. So that's what I wanted to leave you with. I think there are difficult times, but there are also times of opportunity. I think there are times when acts of imagination, as I, as I called it, acts of true power, will resonate and can transform the way we think of ourselves. I'm looking forward to answering some of your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming to Stanford. Thank you, Thank you for being such an ardent and passionate supporter of the US-India relationship. Uh, it's great to have you here. I uh, wanted to start by asking you something, since you spoke about the Yatra, uh, about this dis disconnect between politics and people. I imagine you're not planning on walking every year or every few months across India to gather information. What I know, it's not, it's not a bad thing. <laughs> Perhaps. It's, it's, I mean, every year is difficult. Um, probably not possible. Um, but I think a little bit of movement's not a bad thing. Fair enough. That's, that's a good point. But somehow, in a democracy, we expect this to be institutionalized in some way, right? Same as in the US. 
Uh, as you said, we have a disconnect, it sometimes feels like, between what our people want and uh, what our politicians say or what our politics are all about. I think the disconnect has a lot to do with concentration of wealth and sort of the inequality in society and also uh, the political system not being able to catch up with the social media and the technology. So there's a little bit of lag between the political system and the, the technological progress. And I think demo democracies are, are struggling. Yeah. Even though this is a point in time where technology is supposed to be connecting us like never before, what you're saying is that these institutions, sometimes it, it lags a little bit behind. Yeah. I mean, the, uh, the, systems, are not the, the systems are not designed for this level of connectivity. Mm. And so I think a little bit of evolution in the systems is going to take some time, but it'll happen. Mm -hmm. yeah. And what about social media generally? We're in the, in the land of big tech right now. What role can technology play in trying to understand, perhaps bridge that divide, or do you think it's just fundamentally on these institutions, the governance structures? I mean, it, it creates an asymmetry in information. Mm. So, for example, uh, in our case, the government has information that the opposition does, just doesn't have. Mm. Right? And that, that can be used uh, politically. So that's one aspect of it. The second is it clusters people together and sort of creates silos where these silos have their own sort of belief structure and, and they're, they're, separate, they're separated from other people. Mm -hmm. So it, paradoxically, it reduces the conversation. You would think that more connectivity would you know, simply increase the conversation. It's not necessarily the case. Mm -hmm. And so then it becomes important for politicians such as yourself to, to beat the dirt and walk on the... Yeah, and, the and it... Uh, it's surprising, it was very surprising to me how effective and powerful it is. Because when you do that, the, the social media system, the press system actually doesn't have a choice anymore. Because, because their attention gets captured. So even if they want to move their attention, mm. a, a act like walking across uh, the country just fixates the tension. I think this is, I mean, this is, I, I, I understood the sort of Gandhi's salt march much better because I suspect at that time also, you know, with radio and, and with and these technological changes, they were facing similar problems. And I think that, that idea of walking across the country forces people to say, okay, so what's going on there? And then, and then the thing starts to work. That makes sense. Uh, just turning to the purpose of your visit, uh, U.S.-India relations, what would you say is the current status of how our two countries work together? I think there's a lot of good work that has been done mm -hmm. from 